DHCP. Imagine having to go around to a thousand client computers and manually configuring IP addresses on all of them. Sounds like fun? Now imagine one of those computers has to change its IP address. Now you need to revisit each of these computers again and update them. No, it doesn't sound like fun, and that's exactly the reason that DHCP was invented. The Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, or DHCP for short, allows a central server to manage and maintain the IP addressing scheme for your environment. To install a DHCP server, we'll click on Start, and then we'll click on the Manage Your Server Wizard. Then we'll click on Add or Remove a Role, and we'll click Next, and the wizard will just gather some information about our system, and then we'll collect, select DHCP Server, and then of course we'll click Next, and we'll see the summary which is going to install a DHCP server and then it's going to run the new scope wizard so we can configure a new DHCP scope on our server. Now I'll just pause the video while some files copy across to our server. Okay, so the files have copied and now we're presented with the new scope wizard so we'll click next and now we have to enter in a name for our scope. Now you can call it basically whatever you like but what we'll do here is we'll just call our one uh, test company for example and then we'll click on next. Now at this point we need to provide an IP address range for our scope. So what we'll do is we'll just provide uh, the full ID here of our uh, class uh, C network which will be 192.168.0.1 through to 192.168.0.254. Now you can see down the bottom here that the length and the subnet mask is already populated for us which is kind of nice. So everything here looks fine and dandy so we'll click on next. And now we need to add any exclusions. Now an exclusion is an IP address or a range of IP addresses that the DHCP server will not hand out to clients that request an IP address. So in other words, if you have an IP address that you want to make double sure that clients don't take, then we can include it here in the exclusion list and the DHCP scope will no longer hand out that IP address. You see, it's all pretty logical. Now you can actually enter a single IP address in here if you want as well, so we'll actually do that. What we'll do is we'll enter in 192.168.0.1 which is the IP address of our default gateway and then we'll click on add. Now we'll also enter in 192.168.0.11 which is this server's IP address because we want to maintain a static IP address for our DHCP server. So again we'll click on add and we also have an additional server of 192.168.0.12 and we'll click on add for that one as well. So we have three IP addresses that the DHCP server will not hand out to clients. So we'll click on next and now we can set the least duration. The least duration is just a setting that defines how long a client can use an IP address that's been supplied from our DHCP server before that IP address is taken back into the pool of available IP addresses. Now you can see here it sets to uh, eight days of, as the default. Now that's fine by us, so we'll just click on next. Now we'll get to configure some other information that the DHCP server will supply to a client that requests an IP address. Now this is going to include things like um, DNS names, um, Win servers, etc, etc. So we'll leave the default here, which is yes, we will configure those options now. Now we can actually specify our default gateway. Now our default gateway, as we mentioned earlier, which we did also provide an exclusion for, is 192.168.0.1, and then we'll click on Add. Then we'll click Next. Now we can enter the domain name and the DNS servers. So our parent domain is testdomain.com and our server name is server01 and we'll click on resolve and we can see the IP address has now been put here. So we'll click add and then we'll click next. Now if we have any Wins servers we can also do the same thing here. So what I'll do is I do actually have Wins installed on this same server. So I'll click in, type in server1 and I'll click resolve and again I'll click add and then we'll click next. Okay, so our wizard's basically done now. Uh, we have the option here of activating this scope immediately, and we will do that, so we'll choose Next, and then we'll choose Finish. Now we can see that our server is now a DHCP server, so we'll click Finished, and we're done. Now before a DHCP server can be let loose in your network and start servicing clients, it must first be authorized. Now if you see events in your system log with an event ID of 1046, this will point you to the fact that you have a DHCP server in your network that's not authorized to issue IP addresses. Having to authorize a server before it can issue an IP address is a good security feature as it prevents people in your organization 
From building a Windows 2000 or 2003 server of their own, perhaps for testing purposes, and then connecting it to your network and inadvertently have it start issuing rogue IP addresses. Now this of course will not prevent a Unix or a Linux server from affecting your network though. So to authorize our DHCP server, we'll click on Start, Administrative Tools and DHCP. Now we'll just expand this to make it a little bit easier to see. Now if we expand our current server, we can see that its icon is displayed with a little red arrow pointing down which just provides a visual indication of the current status of our DHCP server. Now over here on the right we can see the status is currently not authorized. So what we can do is we can right click on our server and then we'll select authorize. Now sometimes this can take a few moments to occur so what you might actually have to do is refresh the screen and in fact refreshing the screen then just showed us uh, uh, the status of our um, DHCP server is now changed to active and we can see this visually by the green arrow pointing upwards. OK, we'll expand our scope which has the network address of 192.168.0.0 and you can see we have four available options. The first, address pool, shows the range of IP addresses in our scope. Now it also shows what exclusions we've set. The exclusions are identified over here in the right hand side by a little red X. This just simply gives you a visual cue that these IP addresses will not be handed out by our DHCP server. So to add a new exclusion, we'd simply right click on our address pool and select new exclusion range. Now from here, we can simply enter in a single IP address or a range of IP addresses and then click add and they will be added to our exclusions. The address leases section shows the IP addresses that have been supplied to clients as well as the name of the computer that currently owns the lease and when the lease expires or if the lease is a reserved IP address. Now as you can see we currently don't have any IP addresses leased out to clients but we will come back to this when we get to that in a moment. Now reservations shows you the IP addresses that has been reserved. So suppose that Bob, one of our field engineers, he calls me up and he tells me that he needs to put a new server in our network and this server is going to have the same IP address issued to it at all times. Now I can use a reservation to ensure that my DHCP server doesn't go out and hand his IP address out to somebody else. So to create a new reservation, I'd simply right click on reservations and select new reservation. Now we're prompted to enter a reservation name, the IP address we want to reserve, as well as the MAC address of the computer's network card, and finally a description of the reservation just to make future identification easier. Now out of all these fields here, the description field is the only optional field. Now to get the MAC address of a computer, we can simply open up a command prompt, and then we can type in ipconfig slash all. Now down here under physical address we can see the MAC address of our local server. But of course Bob called me and he asked me to reserve an IP address for a computer which isn't this local computer. So what I'll need to do is I could simply fire off a ping to Bob's computer that he's referring to. And we can see here that in our ping response, the client Bob's referring to, XP client, has an IP address of 192.168.0.125. Now that we've pinged his computer, we could simply type in ARP minus G and we'll hit enter. And now we can see the MAC address that corresponds to XP client. So what I'll do now is I'll right click on this and I'll click mark. And then I'll just mark this IP address. I'll hit enter to copy it. And now we'll come back to our DHCP reservation. We can simply paste in the MAC address. Now what we'll have to do is remove these dashes because our DHCP console doesn't actually like the dashes and it will be invalid formatting for this particular console. And now we can just simply enter in the name of the PC, which was XP Client, and then we'll just provide it with an IP address. In fact, we'll give it this address of 130, and then we'll just click Add. And now we'll click on Close, and we can see here that under our reservations, we have a reservation for XP Client with the IP address of 192.168.0.130. So here we are on Bob's XP Client, and what we'll do is we'll go down to the properties of our network card, and when we'll select TCP IP. Now instead of having these manually configured options, we'll now choose to obtain our IP addresses and DNS server addresses automatically. And then we'll go to a, a command prompt and we'll type in ipconfig slash all to see what's uh, going on here. We can see we currently don't have an address, so what we'll need to do now is we'll need to renew our IP address. Okay, now we've done that, and we can see what's happened with our XP client. It's gone out and it's picked up the testdomain.com domain name. It's also been assigned the IP address of 0 0.130 from our DHCP server, and of course the subnet mask and default gateway fields have been populated as well. So if we now go and do an ipconfig slash all, 
we can see some of the other information that's come along from our DHCP server. In fact, it's also brought along with it the IP address of the DHCP server, our DNS server, and our primary Win server. Of course, these are all the same server, but this information was populated from our scope and server options, which we'll talk about in a moment. So back on our DHCP server, if we now go back to our address leases, we do see a client IP address which has been leased to XP client with a 0 0.130. Now we can also see that this lease was provided by reservation. So that means that we don't actually see a date or time in here that this lease will expire because it will never expire. Now just a quick tip before we move on, if you do happen to have multiple DHCP servers that could service a client, be sure to repeat the reservation that we just created on each of your DHCP servers to ensure that there's no problems with a separate DHCP server leasing out this IP address to a different client. Okay, in the scope options section, here we can configure the information that your DHCP server will provide your clients when it issues them with IP addresses. Now our DHCP server over here will currently provide clients with a default gateway, a DNS server, and of course some WINS information. Now you recall that when we looked at Bob's XP client computer that it already had all this information and this is exactly where it picked this all up from. Now if we right click on our scope options we can then select configure options to see the available options that our scope will provide to our clients. But I'm going to click cancel on that because we will come back and talk about that in a moment. But now we're going to come to our server options instead and we're going to take a look at how to configure DHCP options for the entire server rather than just a scope. But before we do this I'm actually going to click back on our scope options and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to delete a few of these options that we're currently providing in our scope. And the reason that I'm doing this will become clear to you in a moment. Now I'll leave the default gateway set there. Now we'll click on our server options, we'll right click and we'll set configure options. Now here we're going to set the options that our server will provide DHCP clients when it issues them with an IP address. Now just a moment ago I went and deleted the DNS and also the Win server information. Now what I'm going to do is go and add them back, but we're going to add them at the server level rather than the scope level. So I'm going to go over here and click on DNS server, and then I can either provide a server name or an IP address, and I'll just provide an IP address right here. Now our DNS server has an IP address of 192.168.0.11, and we'll click on add. And then we'll scroll down, and then we'll see the DNS domain name, so we'll check that box as well. And our DNS domain name, if you recall, was testdomain.com, and we'll continue scrolling down until we find our WINS information and we'll have the same IP address here as 192.168.0.11 and again we'll click on add and then we'll scroll down and we'll find our WINS node type so we'll check this box here as well. Now down here under the byte column you can see that it defaults to 0x0 now what we'll do is we'll scroll all the way across the, to the right here and we can see that we have four options now the first option here, uh, B node, is for broadcast. Now if we select this, this means that our WINS client will only ever broadcast for NetBIOS name resolution and it won't ever actually contact our WINS server. Next we have a P node or peer-to-peer -peer mode which is where the WINS client will contact the WINS server directly and it won't broadcast for NetBIOS name resolution. Next we have the M mode or mixed and this is where the WINS client will first broadcast and then it will contact the WINS server if the broadcast doesn't resolve the name. And finally we have the H or hybrid node which will contact the WINS server first and then it will broadcast if the WINS server is unable to resolve the name. Now in most cases you will use the H node and that's what we'll do. So down here we'll enter in 0x8 and then we'll click OK. Oh, and as a side note, now when you do build your scope using the wizard, if you do configure a WINS server, it will actually come up as a hybrid node. Now, our WINS server appears here under our server options. Now, no matter how many scopes in here that we actually define, this WINS server and this DNS server will always be supplied to our clients. So, configuring options for the server here is great because this means we only have to do it once, no matter how many scopes that we actually create. OK, and let's take a look at some of the other options we have here. If we right click on DHCP, we've got two options. We can add a new DHCP server to this console so we can manage it from here. And then we can also manage any authorized servers. So to add a new server, we'd simply select the option and then we'd just browse for the server. 
when you've located the server you wish to add, we we'll just click OK and then the server will appear in the list. Now under the Manage Authorized Servers option, you'll see any servers here that are currently authorized or not authorized. So to authorize a server, we'd simply highlight the server in the list and then click Authorize. To unauthorize a server, we could highlight an authorized server and then click Unauthorized. Now next, if we right click on our server itself, we've got quite a vast array of options here. Now firstly, we can display statistics. Now this just simply shows some information about the IP addresses that have been issued to our clients, as well as some information about the server's uptime, the DHCP packets that have been traveling back and forth from this server, and so on. Next we have new scope. Now this option simply goes through the same wizard we ran when we installed our DHCP server. So we'll just run through it again quickly. Firstly, we'll give our scope a name, and then we'll click Next. Now we'll need to provide an IP range, so we'll just type in 192.168.1.1 and 192.168.1.254. That sounds good enough to me, so we'll click on Next. Now we need to add any exclusions, so we'll just define a default gateway for this one here. We'll choose Next. We'll accept the default lease duration of eight days, and we'll choose Next. Now we can configure our DHCP options, and these are of course things like our DNS and Win servers. But what I've done is I've defined them at the server level, so I'm going to choose No. I'm not going to define these options. And then we'll choose Next, and we'll choose Finish. So here you can see our scope's been created, but it's not activated as indicated by the red arrow. So we'll right-click, or sorry, we'll click on it first, then we'll right-click, and then we'll select Activate. And we'll just refresh just to ensure that everything's okay. Now if we click on Scope Options, you'll see we do actually have DNS servers and Win servers already specified. But we didn't actually specify any, so where'd they come from? Well, they come from over here in our server options. So that was the, the benefit, of course, of us configuring it here at the server, because no matter how many scopes we now create, they're all going to inherit these servers. Okay, we'll right-click again on our server, and we'll see the next option, which is to create a new super scope. Now a super scope is just an administrative grouping of scopes that can support multiple logical IP subnets on the same physical subnet. So let's just say that these two scopes that we've created over here exist on the same physical network, but they're separated by a switch or something, and we'll want to manage them together. So what we can use is a super scope. So we'll select new super scope, which just starts yet another wizard, and we'll give our new super scope a name, and we'll click on next. And now we can select one or more scopes from our available scopes to add to our super scope. So what I'll do is I'll hold down control and I'll select both of these and we'll choose next and then we're done. So over here on the left we can see our super scope has been created and now we can manage both of our scopes using the single super scope. Now the next option we have is a new multicast scope. Now multicast IP addresses allow multiple clients to receive data that a server sends to a single IP address, enabling point-to-multipoint -point communication. Now this type of transmission is often used for things like streaming media, such as uh, video conferencing. Now with multicast addresses, DHCP clients are not automatically assigned to them. They're initiated by the client. So in other words, a client might click on a link, say on an intranet page, which takes them to some sort of streaming media on one of your servers. Then the client would get a multicast address. So we'll select New Multicast Scope, and it starts again, another wizard, so we'll click on Next. Then we'll enter a name in for our multicast scope, and I'll be terribly original here, and I'll give it a name of Multicast, and we'll select Next. Now we'll need to provide a range of IP addresses for our scope. Now notice up here that we can't use our regular IP addresses, as multicast operations are reserved for the range of Class D addresses. So we'll enter in a range that we want to provide multicast for. So how about uh, 224.10.10.10 .10 .10 through to 224.10.10.10. .10 .10 .10 .10. And then we'll choose Next. Now we can add some exclusions to this range if we've seen before. Uh, we'll just click Next, and we can also set the lease duration. Now do note that uh, the lease duration is defaulting to 30 days, not 8, as we've seen with our regular DHCP operations. Now we'll just choose Next. Now would we like to activate this? We'll just say Yes, and we'll choose Finished. And now over here you can see our multicast scope has been created. Now the next thing we have here is a uh, Backup and Restore options. A backup simply takes a copy of the DHCP database and it places it in your system32 slash DHCP slash backup directory. 
Now the backup, including all of your scope information, registry keys, log files, and your DHCP server configuration information, but it won't include any DNS dynamic update credentials. Now you can elect to change the backup directory if you wish, or you can permanently change it in the advanced tab of your server properties. So to back it up, we'll just simply click on backup. It will default to your DHCP backup directory. Just click on OK, and then your backup's been performed. So to restore your database, we'd come down here and choose the restore option, browse to the path of where the backup was, we'll click OK. It's going to tell us that the DHCP service must be stopped and restarted. Would we like to continue? Click yes and simply confirm the restore. It's a really simple process. Now the next thing we had here was reconcile all scopes. Now reconciling all scopes helps us to fix any inconsistencies in the DHCP database. Scope IP address information is stored in the DHCP database in both detailed and summary forms. When we reconcile scopes using this option, the detailed and summary forms are compared against each other and then the DHCP service will either restore the IP addresses to the host that currently owns them or it will create a temporary reservation for these addresses. Now our next option is to unauthorize our DHCP server and that's kind of self-explanatory. Now then we can define user classes. Now user classes are useful to categorize, if you like, groups of users to handle their dynamic IP addressing differently. So for example, you might have mobile users that frequently move from site to site. In this case, we could set a shorter lease duration that only hands out IP addresses, say, for one day, but a desktop user at the same site could have an IP address for much longer. So clicking on define user classes gives us the ability to define our own user class category. Now as you can see, we do have a couple of default ones here. Now we can add our own by simply clicking add and then just filling in the details. Now the next option we had was to define vendor classes, which basically does the same thing as our user classes, except we would assign a vendor class by the operating system that they're using. So we could assign a different set of DHCP options to a client that's running Windows 98 than we would for a client that's perhaps running Windows XP. Now again, we have some predefined ones in here, but of course we can create our own. Now at this point, if we right click on server options and select configure options, and then go to our advanced tab, then we can choose our vendor or user classes from these drop down boxes here. And then we can define any options that we want them to have. So for example, if we selected the user class of routing and remote access, we could set our dial up users to be directed down here to perhaps a different DNS server and so on. Now this option gives us a lot of flexibility as to where we want to direct our clients. Now the other options we had here when we right clicked on our server was uh, set predefined options. Now this just allows us to control which options are available for our DHCP server or scopes to include in the results that they send to clients. And finally, we can take a look at the properties of our DHCP server. Now we have three tabs, general, DNS and advanced. And on the default tab, which is the general tab, we can elect to automatically update statistics on a predefined schedule. We can also enable DHCP audit logging, which is enabled by default. And this will write out audit information to a log file called DHCP served log, followed by the current day. So in other words, if today was Monday, the file would be called DHCP served log hyphen mun. Now you can turn off logging if you want by unchecking this box, but it's advisable to leave it on for troubleshooting purposes. And finally, we can elect to show the boot p table folder. Now on the DNS tab, we can configure our DHCP server to talk to our DNS server on the client's behalf. Now by default, enabling DNS dynamic updates is selected and it's advisable to leave this setting as it stands. Now coupled with the enabled setting above, this setting here will enable the DHCP server to automatically update Windows 2000, XP and 2003 clients forward and reverse lookup zones with the DNS server. So it's advisable to leave this setting as it is, although you could choose to always dynamically update any host and pointer records if you like. Now next we can choose to discard host and pointer records when the lease is deleted. Now this is checked by default and again should remain checked. This button will contact the DNS server when a client no longer has a certain IP address to let it know that its IP address has changed. Now pointer records are deleted automatically when the lease expires, so regardless of this setting, so that's kind of irrelevant here anyway. Now for the final box which isn't selected by default, this should be selected if you have older Windows 98, NT and ME clients as these clients cannot automatically update their forward and reverse lookup records with the DNS server. So after receiving an IP address from a DHCP server, the DHCP server can then perform this operation for them.
And then finally we have the advanced tab. Now this is where we can set confliction detecting by providing a value in this box. Now currently it's set to the default which is zero. Now this means our DHCP server will not detect conflicts. If we set this to a non-zero value then this will enable this feature. Confliction detection simply makes the DHCP server ping each IP address that it intends to offer a client to make sure that someone else isn't using it, for example if they've set their client up to use a manual static address. Now if the ping fails, indicating that no one's using this IP, then the DHCP server can then assign the IP address to the client. Now below we can also set the paths to our audit logs, our DHCP database, as well as the backups of our DHCP database. If we click on the bindings button, we can change the network interfaces that our DHCP server will listen on. But we only have one network card in our server, so we only have the one option here. But if you had multiple network cards, then you'd see them listed for selection in this window. Now clicking on the credentials button allows us to select an account that we can use which will update the dynamic DNS records on our DNS server. So in here we just simply type in a username, domain name and password and then we'd click on OK. Now by default administrators have access to make changes to our DHCP server. When we first installed DHCP on this server, two new security groups were created, those being DHCP administrators and DHCP users. Now these two groups by default do not contain any members, so if you do have people in your organization such as say help desk users that you'd like to be able to view your DHCP server but not make any changes, then you would add them here to the DHCP users group. Similarly, if you have any administrators you want to be able to manage this DHCP server, then add them over here to the DHCP administrators group and then they'll be able to manage your DHCP servers for you. Now the final thing we should take a look at here in our DHCP console is the properties of our individual scopes. Now a lot of the options that are in here we've already talked about when we looked at the properties of our server. However on the general tab of our DHCP scope we'll notice a slight difference here where we can see the IP address range that this scope's going to manage and the least duration information. The DNS tab is basically the same and on the advanced tab is where we can assign IP addresses dynamically to clients which are either DHCP only, boot TP only, or both. So you can set those options here if you wish. Now before wrapping up this discussion of DHCP, we'll take one final look at our scope option, so we'll right click and select properties. Now here you can see the network range that our uh, scope is actually responsible for, as well as the least duration information. Now I should mention that any options that you configure at the scope level will override any of the options that are configured at the server level. So if we happen to want a least duration for our scope of say four days, we could certainly set that here. And then even though our server options has it listed back at the default of eight days, for this particular scope, we'll now have a least duration of four. Now on our DNS tab, we'll see the exact same options that we saw on the DNS tab of our server properties. And finally, on our advanced tab, we can see that currently we're only assigning addresses to DHCP clients. But we could select boot TP if we like, or we could select both. Okay, so that's DHCP in detail. Now what we'll do is we'll move on and we'll take a look at the DHCP relay agent.